Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our provost to you, Dr. Mark Sargent. Mark is, uh, sounds awfully formal, Mark, but he's had a, he's had a distinguished career in uh, three Christian colleges that I know about, uh, Biola, uh, Gordon, and now here at Westmont. He's our provost. Uh, all I can say about Mark Sargent is that whenever he's in charge of something, uh, I just feel safe that it's going to be good and uh, it's going to be uh, helpful. And Mark works very hard. Uh, I'm glad you get to meet him early on in this semester. And Mark, would you come up and uh, share with us the things you've been given to say? Let's welcome our provost. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Lisa, for that, uh, that wonderful world. Uh, it's always exciting when students return to campus. I love the energy in the room. I mean, I work at Westmont during the summer. It's nice here, but I see more lizards and students during that time. Uh, but it's nice to have you all back. I want to give a special word to, of welcome to the transfer students. Uh, I know the lights are out. They can't stand, but let's welcome them. We're glad that our transfer students are here. I know sometimes when you come to a place, there's so much emphasis on the new class, class of 2020, uh, and a lot of our transfers are joining classes that are already in motion. So wel welcome aboard. We're glad you're a part of our community. Several years ago, I came to Santa Barbara as a transfer student myself. No, not to Westmont, unfortunately, but to UCSB. My very first class was on William Shakespeare, and the teacher was a guest professor on leave from Oxford University. He was also an accomplished director and a literary consultant for the BBC. And in that very first cl class session, he had us really enthralled with stories about the English stage, and then suddenly shifted tone, grew solemn, and told us why he was there. Not long before, his 19-year-old daughter had been walking on a short wall in England when she slipped hit her head and died. Coming to California was his way of dealing with healing. He wanted to walk the beach. He wanted to find solace in the warm breezes. And as part of his process of grief, he would read passages aloud from Shakespeare. So that day, that very first class session, he opened up the text of King Lear, perhaps the darkest of Shakespeare's tragedies and read us some lines about the king's mourning for his daughter Cordelia. You could feel the pain in his fierce search to find language equal to his sorrows and his doubt. That was the day I recall when I decided to become an English major. In fact, it may have been the day when I decided to become a college professor. It was certainly a day when class felt more like church. He was inspirational in his passion for learning, and confessional in his tone. Willing to face hard questions without surrendering hope. It seemed one of those rare moments when education was a blend of inquiry and compassion. In many ways, that's exactly what I want a good Christian liberal arts program to be, a search for knowledge that values the care of the soul. Now, before saying a little bit more about that theme and a little bit more about Shakespeare, let me reflect for, back for a moment to our service on Monday. We, we broke bread together on Monday. At the Last Supper, Jesus gave new meaning to the process of breaking bread, but it was already a key theme in Jewish tradition and practice. In that warm culture, in that warm setting, the thick crust on the bread helped protect its internal freshness. And, and in breaking it at the start of a meal, you were giving the gift of that freshness to your guests. It also made it easier for the bread to absorb the various foods and seasonings that were part of the cuisine in the Mediterranean world. It is a process of absorption that is shared during a common meal, a shared meal not unlike the learning that we will do together in this semester now that we have broken bread ourselves. This morning I want to encourage you to absorb some of the gifts of spiritual and intellectual life that are beyond the classroom. This includes some of the rich conversations that you'll have as you eat together, as you talk for long hours in the residence halls, in the common journeys on athletic fields, in COPEX day groups, or in prayer together. But other key parts of the landscape of Westmont are the numerous scholarly lectures, the artistic events, in the museum, in our theater, in our recital halls, 
that make your learning richer and more varied. All part of the big banquet here. And let me underscore one special opportunity this fall. Thanks to theater professor John Blondell, Westmont has acquired 37 short films based on the plays of William Shakespeare. These films were produced by Shakespeare's Globe, which is a company that works in the modern recreation of Shakespeare's theater in London. And they were shown last spring in London on 37 screens along the banks of the Thames. And now they are being shown in limited places, such as Liverpool, Poland, Egypt, Spain, and Westmont. We have a very unique opportunity here. Each film is really a collage. The most fascinating thing about them is how they splice together different portions of the same play, different scenes from the same director, or di scenes from different directors cut and pasted together in a single thread. And I'm going to show you uh, some scenes from King Lear. I do this in anticipation of what's coming with the films. I do this with my former professor in mind. And when it's done, I'm going to use these scenes as some prompts for some comments on the blend of faith and the liberal arts. First, some context for those of you unfamiliar with the play. King Lear is based on the 8th century British legend about an aging king who wishes to divide his land between three daughters. At the outset, he gives all of them a love test, asking them to express their great love for him. His first two daughters give effusive, exaggerated praise and he grants them their reward. His youngest daughter, Cordelia, loves him dearly, but refuses to exaggerate. And he angrily rejects her and denies her an inheritance. You might guess what happens from there. The two oldest daughters, once they have land and power, reject their father, banish him, and he begins to lose his mind, overcome by his own foolishness and the injustice of the world. Crazed and disoriented, he flies into the wilderness and into a storm. Many scholars have noted parallels with the book of Job, both men angry with the God they hear in the winds and the storm. We will watch three short scenes that are spliced together. The first is a stage production of the storm scene by a troupe from the nation of Belarus. And you will notice how they have to artificially create a storm on stage. I'll talk about that artifice a little bit later. Another scene finds a crazed, white-haired King Lear in the open field above the famous cliffs of Dover. As always, it may take a little concentration to listen to Shakespeare's language, but even in this first time through for some of you, you can catch his disorientation, his broken spirit, his despair about life. He mourns about how easily our vices are exposed once we are out of power and in tattered cloths and how we cry when we are born and when we realize that the world can be a great stage of fools. And then in the final scene, we get Lear's reunion with his banished daughter, Cordelia, in that same setting above the White Cliffs, a scene in the play that comes closest to a glimpse of Christian grace. In between the three scenes is some footage from an old silent film from the 1920s, now colorized. All of this in six minutes. Look and listen. So what is it that we just saw? There's much that we could unpack in those scenes. But in our few remaining minutes, let me use those scenes to offer quick, three quick thoughts about the blend of the liberal arts and faith. First, I am compelled by such scenes to think about how faith and learning do indeed prompt prompt us to seek knowledge and exercise compassion. The wide lens of the liberal arts gives us a broad panorama on the human condition and the state of the world. It reminds us that we need intellectual courage in our theology and service to face those challenges, just not good intentions from a place of security and well-being. What we see in these scenes in the wild, the deranged king, the uncertain reconciliation, may urge us towards compassion but not without underscoring the complexity of issues that require remarkable persistence to pursue a resolution. Watching the white-haired king makes me appreciate the value of psychology, those equipped to deal with signs of dementia, the tumultuous interplay of guilt and anger, the crippling effects of depression. There are also questions of justice that require legal and political nuance. As we contemplate whether the king's ramblings are really repentance, or just a lust to return to power. 
In the scene of reconciliation between father and daughter, we are reminded of the extraordinary power of Christ-like forgiveness. And yet this is a tragedy. And before all is said and done, Cordelia, like Christ, will pay for her goodness with her life. That certainly leaves questions for the ethicist, sociologist, and theologian about how we foster hope in our communities where there is an unequal distribution of justice among the humble and the innocent. In coming together to address such questions, Christians, I believe, can see the liberal arts as a communion of scholars, not just a variety of scholars. Much of higher education emphasizes specialization, which can lead to precision but also runs the risk of separating scholar from scholar. Yet most of the challenges in our world require interdisciplinary solutions, the blending of different perspectives, whether we are talking about mental health and domestic harmony, as we see in Lear, or clean water and urban health. I do believe that a community that breaks bread together in gratitude to God and in allegiance to a greater good than self-interest can best hold to this vision of collaboration within the different liberal arts fields. Second, the liberal arts can promote cross-cultural empathy and understanding for the Christian. For me, one of those cross-cultural moments came when I saw the scene from the, the Belarusian trip. When I, the troop. When I first saw Lear tossed around in that blue tarp, I thought it was simply a, an artifice used on stage to approximate the wind and the rain, which it clearly is. But then after some reading, I learned to see it through a Belarusian lens. In that nation, the theater troupe portrayed King Lear as an autocrat, a man with a literal iron fist, a clear echo of the political strongmen who ruled the country in a Soviet and post-Soviet era. Only in the storm does Lear confront the power of protest as his helpless body is drenched, drenched by the people whom he had manipulated. When stories cross boundaries, they absorb new hopes, fears, and cultural contexts. Rejoice with those who rejoice, writes Paul in Romans, weep with those who weep. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. That is true, I assume, not only in our hometown of Judea, but also in Samaria and beyond. And third, and finally, the liberal arts encourage imagination in our exercise of faith. Richard Hayes, a theologian at Duke, notes that the duty of the Christian is to live in imaginative obedience to the moral vision of the New Testament. He asserts that to be a follower of Christ, to apply the core principles of a first century gospel to the features of modern life, requires a full range of the imagination. Careful reading, the capacity for empathy, capacity for foresight, and the creative re-envisioning of solutions to many of the ills around us. All good liberal arts qualities. I don't know about you, but I was struck by the very creative transition in our film when the scene shifted back to the cliffs of Dover and two black actors held the roles of Lear and Cordelia. We had just been in this setting with the white-haired Caucasian actor as Lear. There he was at this iconic site on the British seaboard declaiming lines from the most esteemed of all Anglo-Saxon playwrights. Lines from a play that has deep roots in an 8th century British fable. But when we shifted back to the scene, the roles were held by those of African descent, including an actress with an immigrant mother from Uganda. I was especially gripped by that moment when the daughter assures the king, using actual lines from Shakespeare, that this is his kingdom even as they stare over those iconic cliffs of Dover. It is a bold theatrical insinuation that England, the land, as well as the literary and cultural legacy exemplified by Shakespeare, belongs to a multicultural, multicolored modern society. This is the one clearly Christ-like moment in the play. And in the hands of the artist, that imitation of Christ has become an inclusive, imaginative gesture towards racial understanding. We started this year by breaking bread together, even as Jesus commanded his followers to do. And at that last supper, it was as if he was breaking his own body as a gift to his guests. When we do break bread in Christ's name, we remember his sacrificial gift to us. But we should also be compelled to remember his generosity. With whom do we break bread? Who do we invite to our tables? Can we be imaginative in our service, more capable of understanding across boundaries, 
more willing to see our own community, students, staff, and faculty alike, as a communion eager to blend knowledge and compassion. I pray that it will be so. Let's pray together as we close. Lord, help us to break bread with joy in our community, with wonder in your world and all that you have provided for us, with commitment to inquire, explore, and work towards renewal and reconciliation, with hospitality for the stranger, for our friends, and with deep gratitude for your grace and provisions, your sacrifice for us. Give us hope in our studies, in our visions of service, and in our daily walk with you. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.